generalizations and alternative materials models. So in this video, we will discuss briefly applying the Lorentz model to permeability and how that can describe the permeability because there are magnetic resonances. Then we'll talk about materials with multiple resonances and how to handle that. And we'll finish the lecture by mentioning a bunch of other materials models and, and mentioning a little bit about where they're applied. Lorentz model for permeability. Let's remember what happens for dielectrics. We have an electron cloud around the nucleus, along comes an electric field, it displaces those electron clouds, that's storing electric energy. Uh, when that restores back to its equilibrium position, we now have moving charges that re-radiates tiny little secondary waves that combines with the applied wave out of phase. We get an overall slowing response and we call that the dielectric response of materials. Now for a magnetic response, we have circulating charges, electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. And if this pattern is more like a donut than a sphere, well, we actually get a magnetic field. So we get a magnetic dipole through the center of that rotation, through the axis of that rotation. Now, in most materials, this is random. And so all these little magnetic dipoles are randomly oriented. But if along comes a magnetic field, all of these magnetic dipoles will tend to align with this magnetic field. And now suddenly we're storing magnetic energy at the atomic scale. But it's sort of like these are also attached to springs. When we pulled them straight, when we let go by setting the, or letting the magnetic field vanish, those spring back into place. And there's an oscillation, there's a resonance, and we fit that also to a Lorentz oscillator model, even though the actual mechanisms are a little bit different. So we can write the Lorentz oscillator model just like we did for the complex permittivity, except now we'll have what's called a magnetic plasma frequency. We'll have a magnetic resonant frequency and a magnetic damping rate. But we can see it's the same equation. It's the same fit and we get the same Lorentz response from it. So really everything we've learned about the Lorentz model for dielectrics applies to permeability. Materials with multiple resonances. So this really is the real case. There's no material that just has a single resonance. They all have multiple resonances, and a lot of times the, the resonances are very close and things look really confusing. So we'll try to simplify some of this and explain some peculiar things that happen when we have multiple resonances. So how do we account for multiple resonances? Well, we just simply sum all of the Lorentz oscillators for each each uh, resonance type. Now there is still only one plasma frequency. It's not like each resonance has its own plasma frequency because the plasma frequency is a resonance all of on its own. So the, the plasma frequency comes to the outside of the summation, but we sum all of these. And so in principle, this, this number, which is called the oscillator strength, it really wasn't there. But what people noticed when they looked at these multiple resonances is that they had different strengths. And so they had to put a factor in there to account for that. And so that's the oscillator strength. And so one thing that's interesting, if we sum all of these oscillator strength, in principle, we should get the number of electrons back. But really, uh, this is really just controlling the strength of each resonance relative to the other resonances. Okay, so here we plotted just an example where we have a series of Lorentz resonances. And I've spaced them out close enough, just so that we're far enough away that we can see all of them. Now here's where it gets weird. 90% of the time, or maybe even 99% of the time, permittivity is increasing. And that happens be below resonances and it happens above resonance. So 99% of the time, it's increasing. Yet the overall trend is to go down. And that seems contradictory. And the reason that is, is because on resonance over a very short span of frequencies, that permittivity makes huge jumps downwards. At the DC side, each one of these resonances is contributing an offset. So over here, we can roughly say that's probably one. And so right at this point, the, this distance here, that's the offset contributed from each one of those resonances. So now in a real material, we may have overlapping resonances. And so that we lose being able to see the Lorentz shape and it can get a little bit more confusing. Just to give you an example that this is real, here's fused silica. So this is glass and we're plotting the refractive index and the extinction coefficient. And we can clearly see that there's Lorentz resonances in place here. 
So this is a real thing. And we see it's not so clean, and that's really because there's multiple resonance mechanisms happening, and they're all sort of interfering with each other, and we don't get necessarily nice, clean uh, Lorentz responses from it. But this is still pretty good. A lot of times when you see materials models, you'll see this permittivity at infinity, but we're talking about at a low frequency. Uh, what on earth is happening here? So remember the concept where each Lorentz resonance contributes a DC offset. So all of these resonances up here, down at these low frequencies is contributing an offset. Well, what if we're designing a device or running a simulation or something like that, and we're really only interested in these frequencies? Why would we develop a complicated model that would resolve the shape of all these Lorentz resonances? Well, in effect, all the way down here, all these are doing is contributing an offset. And so that's the purpose of this epsilon infinity term. This is representing the offset of all of these resonances that are off to some super high frequency that we're not interested in. That's really what this infinity means. We're interested in frequencies down here, yet all of the ones at super high frequencies are only contributing this offset and that's our epsilon infinity. There is what's called the generalized Lorentz Drude model. This is both a Lorentz model and a Drude model. And here's how that works. So first of all, we'll have this epsilon infinity. So we're able to account for resonances that are much higher than we're actually interested in designing our device. So we don't necessarily need to resolve what they look like on their resonances. We just will lump all of their offsets here. But you know what, there may be some resonances within the range of frequencies that we're interested in. We do have to account for them. And so this is a sum of Lorentz resonances. Now one might ask, where's the Drude model in here? Remember how we got to the Drude model. The Drude model is the Lorentz model, just without a restoring force. And we set the resonant frequency equal to zero. So that's how we actually arrive at a Lorentz Drude model. We just sum a bunch of Lorentz resonances. And usually for the first resonance, we will set that resonant frequency to zero. So this first summation, if you will, the first Lorentz model really is a Drude model, and then we're adding a bunch of Lorentz models to it. And so here's a table of some typical metals that we would simulate maybe in like a finite difference time domain code or finite element code. And the other thing I'll mention, when things are done this way, a lot of times the actual physics of the resonance isn't so much a concern and they're just doing an empirical fit to within the frequency range we're interested in. So when you see this and when you get these numbers from papers, that doesn't necessarily mean they've got an accurate picture of exactly where these resonances are, their, their gammas and all that. Uh, it's more an empirical fit to make this work within whatever frequency range we're interested in. Sometimes we'll hear about the situation uh, is normally stated as isolated absorbers in a transparent host. And normally what this means, you have a nice well-behaved background. Maybe it's glass, maybe it's a fluid, something nice, well-behaved, low loss, and we dope it with something. And it, there's some kind of strong absorber. Uh, and so we write the overall polarization of this mixture as the polarization of this nice, well-behaved host plus whatever it is we've added to it, the polarization of that. So we would write our complex permittivity this way. We'll have the susceptibility of the host, that's sort of our nice well-behaved background. And then because our absorber is stronger, we have to write the full Lorentz equation for that. Now let's look at this in terms of two special cases. First case is at very, very high frequencies. And so we'll put an affinity in for the frequency and if frequency is infinity, this absorber thing drops and we really just have one plus chi host. And so we will write that as epsilon infinity. The next thing is at very low frequencies. So if we set our frequency to zero and then this to zero, we just have the plasma frequency squared over omega naught squared. And of course, one plus chi host, which we've written as epsilon infinity. So at very high frequencies, we have our epsilon infinity plus plasma frequency squared divided by omega naught squared. Now this is a very interesting equation because that epsilon at very low frequencies and the epsilon at very high frequencies are things that we can measure. 
And so if we know the resonant frequency of the thing that we've doped with, and then we subtract these two epsilons, this gives us a nice way to measure the plasma frequency. And so that's interesting. So we can dope something with little metal particles, measure low frequency permittivity, high frequency permittivity, and calculate the plasma frequency this way. Other material models. So all of the models I'm going to talk about next, uh, in practice, they're all derived empirically or solved empirically. The constants are found empirically. The equations themselves, like for this cole coal model, are actually derived from physics-based equations to represent a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. But in the end, the parameters, it's done as a curve fit and found empirically. And a lot of times the parameters that are found don't necessarily represent the real parameters of the material simply because there need to be way more terms for each of those constants to represent all the resonances and stuff physically. So we're, we're truncating number of resonances, simplifying the model. So it really kind of does become a, uh, an empirical fit. So this is the cole cole model. And it does account for wideband frequency dielectric properties, commonly used in polymers and organic materials. And it is physics derived, but the equations are empirically derived, particularly this alpha parameter. The Cauchy equation or the Cauchy model. And here we're calculating the refractive index as a function of wavelength. And what we'll see is this, this really is not physical at all. We don't see any kind of Lorentzian or Drew kind of behavior at all. So this is completely an empirical equation, completely an empirical fit. And these constants are used all the time to specify glass for lenses. So they're best applied for transparent, transparent media because you won't see any uh, imaginary part to refractive index here. No way to account for the loss. So very commonly, these, these parameters are given to specify glasses for lenses and things like that. The Selmayr equation. Now, this is a little bit more physical related in that we have a, the sum of a bunch of terms here for calculating our refractive index. And each one is supposed to represent a different resonance in the glass. Uh, but at the end of the day, really, this is stuff derived empirically. And so the Selmayr equation another also used a lot to specify glasses, uh, a bit more physically accurate than the Cauchy model. And you'll also see different versions of the Selmayr equation that counts for, for different physics, like temperature dependence of materials is really common, uh, with how the refractive index might change with temperature. Uh, 